Hallo, schönen guten Abend zusammen. Wir fangen an mit der Session Corp versus Corp Profiling Modern, Modern Espionage. So it's something about espionage and espionage. The session will be brought to you by Roberto Pratoni and Fabio Gioni. Guten Abend. Wie geht's? This is, I was studying actually German when I was a kid, but uh, I never practiced it, so I, I forgot it, I'm sorry. Well, Scheiße, I just remember, but <laughs> just, okay, it will be in English. Um, we will talk today about uh, uh, profiling modern state uh, and industrial espionage. Before starting, uh, uh, my colleague actually, we we'll talked together with me, he is Fabio Gioni, and uh, beside being a personal friend of mine, he's, uh, in my opinion, one of the best professional in the counter-espionage, counter-intelligence, and anti-terrorism field. He has a broad experience uh, also in telecommunication. While uh, uh, me, personally, I am the Zone H guy, so the, the script kiddie. And uh, we, <laughs> but we are balancing together, so. Uh, I would like to introduce you before starting uh, our new project, uh, just a few months old. Maybe uh, you were reading on the website of the CCC about the releasing of a hacker comic. Uh, this is our fourth episode. So we produced a hacker comic, especially for this uh, Congress. At the end of this presentation, we have only 50 of such CDs containing the hacker uh, PD comic PDF plus uh, a music track named after the Congress, private investigation. And if you don't get your copy of the CD, don't worry, because we will hand over a lot more of CDs during the final ceremony uh, at, the end of the, uh, at the end of the Congress. And please just take one copy, not a bunch of them. So you can leave for everybody. Um, thanks. <laughs> Special guests. Uh, as a special guest in this uh, comic episode, we have CCC Tim Fritlov. He is quite resembling him. And uh, another guy, which is uh, again a friend of us. We were all together, uh, me, him, Tim Fritlov, and uh, this guy whose name is Gaius. He's a hell of such an engineer. And he could convince your mother that she never delivered you just by talking. Uh, like this. A very interesting guy I would like all of you uh, uh, to meet in your life. Anyway, let's go ahead. And of course, you know the Blink and Lights project. Uh, you have seen also some samples uh, in, the, in the dark room. Uh, the comic will be talking about the new version, the even more interactive version of the Blink and Lights. So quite interesting comic. And uh, of course, uh, it is, uh, you know, CCC loves space. You saw the rocket uh, just parked uh, out there. Uh, so the comic is also about space trips. Now, next. Uh, just a few words about Zone Age. This is not a conference about Zone Age. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't know it. Before Zone Age, actually another German project at oldas.org uh, was uh, existing. We are tracking uh, web server intrusions defacements, basically. I just want to report to you an interesting number. This year, we reported 540,000 web server intrusion. It's a staggering number. Uh, just in 2002, uh, the number of web server intrusion was 10,000, 12,000 maximum per year. Now we get several thousands per day, each day. Now, why am I taking the hassle to reporting this to you? After all, we are just talking about defacements, and defacements are a very stupid crime. Yes, I do agree with you that defacements are a very stupid crime, but they are a very good indi indicator about the vulnerable level of the uh, server side of the Internet, and actually it is the only tangible level, because when we get statistics, uh, statistics from big companies, big vendors, this is just commercial bullshit. I mean, the only way, the only real data we can get, it's from the web server defacements. Also because we set up such system where we don't get the notification of the 
defacement unless the attacker is revealing the technical methodology uh, for the intrusion and even the motivation can be personal or political, which are eventually disclosed to the administrator of the server to help to fix it. Anyway, don't uh, think, okay, they are just kid kiddies, who cares? We are talking about uh, company espionage and state espionage today. If you think uh, that techniques used to do uh, uh, espionage and counter espionage are different from the techniques uh, used by script kiddies, then you're wrong. Very rarely a specific attacking tool is crafted, uh, written for the purpose of violating a specific server. 99% of the time, all you need it is to just use exactly the same techniques used by script kiddies. So this huge number, it's a very good indi indicator for us that the full internet is very vulnerable. Now, we will see a piece of movie very interesting. Okay, just before that, uh, I wanted to just catch the ball that uh, Roberto gave, saying, uh, uh, just to give you an example, there was uh, one time, there were a couple of guys doing a penetration test. Uh, there were two very good skilled guys. Uh, one of them was much more skilled than the other one. And uh, uh, they had the same target, okay? And the less skilled guy, it took about 10 minutes. The other one, it took two hours and a half because the one that uh, made it in two hours and a half had to craft uh, specifically a Trojan horse to do exactly that same thing. So it took a long time to do that and the intelligence cycle just uh, was lost. The, the simple guy, he just did it, you know, very easily in a very simple way, not aesthetic, nothing special, but he just got the product. So now we're gonna show you this uh, little movie and then we're gonna explain you why. Sir, the vehicle is stopped. So this is the real deal now. He's sure this time. He sounds scared, shitless. Good, that's all it is. All units, I read. I say again, I read. Check him up, buddy. One on five, one five up ten. Five, four one on the right. I read! So, some of you might have recognized the movie, or Black Hawk Down, which was uh, taken from a real event. So, why did the... <laughs> the only original copy. Anyway, <clears throat> the reason why I showed it to you, and I took a little bit of your time, 
is because uh, just in this little few minutes they were enclosed all the concept of what is intelligence, what is asymmetric conflict and everything else. So you saw a big superpower spending billions of dollars in satellites, communication, delta force, training of people, big weapons, everything strategies, uh, you know, consultants that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. And then you get uh, a small kid, you know, with a phone. And this small kid with the phone just uh, destroyed this whole operation. Just with a little act, you know, of intelligence, so how much does it cost a small kid with a phone? Just, you know, you feed him, you just give him a food once a day just so he doesn't die too soon. And then you give him a phone and that's it, you pay the phone bill. So uh, this is uh, what, uh, uh, what we are faced with uh, right now it, and what we are going to be faced with in the next conflict, in the next uh, years to come. These people, and this is what's happening in Iraq right now and, and uh, in all the other countries where this type of wars are being fought, you know. Because uh, anybody would use uh, <coughs> unconventional weapons uh, in, uh, in the measure that they don't have anything else to use. I was explaining before to a person at lunchtime, he was asking me, what is unconventional? What is something unconventional? I said, well, it's a, you know, you have a fork, you use it to eat or you use it to stab a person. So the one is conventional, the other one is unconventional. So you use whatever you have. And uh, I remember when uh, the war in Iraq uh, started, there was this uh, little drawing of uh, this huge marine uh, with uh, big weapons and, uh, you know, this night vision things, etc. And this uh, <coughs> small Iraqi, very thin, with the sand, uh, sand in his hand and he threw, threw it in the eye of the marine and said, ah, shit, this is not fair, you're being unconventional. <laughs> and that's, uh, say, say, you need to use the normal weapons, I don't have the money. Anyway, so, so this is, uh, this is the index, never mind, okay. Okay, so this is uh, a thing that uh, almost everybody since uh, 2001 is saying. It says, oh, everything changed after 2001. You know, uh, there is all this uh, big thing that changed the world. And in fact, uh, it did. So that's why I'm showing it. I remember, I mean, I've been working in the security field for 20 years now, and uh, it was so tough to get money to do security. I mean, you just said, oh, I want to do security. Give me a budget and say, uh, why? I say, because I am going to prevent uh, incidents. Say, but if I prevent them, the incidents are not happening. So if they are not happening, there are no incidents. So I'm not going to get the money the next year. And uh, it was really, really difficult. You had to be like a very big social engineer or get really, uh, be, to be a very good friend of the CEO to get uh, money. After 2001, you got big budgets just like that. Governments and the big industries. And... Uh, so what happened then? That uh, this uh, started to happen actually before 2001, but it was amplified by these big budgets. These big, big budgets were being used uh, by companies and by governments, uh, both to do you know, security, defensive security, and the, and the other one is to do offensive security. The offensive security is never mentioned. So <clears throat> we tried to find a word and not to, um, not to dirty the name of the hacker for these people, these people that uh, they don't do something just you know, out of curiosity, but they do it just out of the desire to have more money. You know, okay, you work, you wanna have money, but just to live, you know. These guys, they just want money. They don't care about religion, they don't care about uh, uh, politics, uh, they don't care about uh, people. They just care about making money. And uh, actually, there are quite uh, a lot of them, not so many, professional people that do just this as a job. We call it Jigo, which is uh, a term uh, which comes from go, which is danger in uh, Japanese. You say go, go, go is uh, danger. And then uh, it's like a phantom, somebody that just does something and disappears. Why did we choose this name? Because uh, these people, uh, you never heard about, uh, you never hear about them in the media. Did you ever hear about uh, oh, the, uh, an industry got this, uh, this or that secret stolen? This uh, pharmaceutical industry got this formula stolen and uh, it was given to the, its competitor? You never heard about it because uh, industries and governments don't, let, don't want to let this thing known if they find out. But most of the times, they never find out. And we're going to show you some examples afterwards. So, what is meant by industrial espionage? It's not just uh, the kid going into the server and, uh, you know, print, uh, making a big print out of credit cards or things like that. Things done just out of uh, the desire to, to challenge the system or, uh, you know, to, to be better or to show off with friends or anything. 
industrial espionage is being done just because it produces a lot of economy, okay? I was making before the example of the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, you know that a little formula for a headache pill, it costs uh, in a research and killed animals, uh, I mean, so much money that you wouldn't believe, and about 10 to 12 years of research. And the same is for the military industry, for avionics and everything else. And it takes uh, about, you know, uh, one hour to steal it, to copy it in a floppy disk. I mean, there are no more floppy disks in a USB key. And, uh, and to give it to the competitor and to get a million dollars. It really gets a little, a little effort. So, okay, I can't read it too well, but uh, these are the real cases that are going to be treated, uh, okay? And uh, uh, these uh, are cases that have happened. Some of them, they're not known. In fact, one of them, uh, the one uh, with the K letter, I'm not going to say that uh, corresponds to a big company, a big security company, one of the hugest security company worth billions of dollars. And it got last year in the, um, in the fight with uh, you know, an industrial fight with uh, a competitor or an industry that was being investigated, uh, somebody uh, stole from them 240 gigabytes of data, all their database basically, and uh, they have never found out. Okay, so I'm not gonna say the name of the company because we, I, don't wanna, I don't want them to find out. And uh, <laughs> then you have, <laughs> You know, at the last conference, I said that the hack in the box, I said somebody came from Microsoft, I think, he says, okay, hmm, what could that be? And he started to make a lot of names. I said, no, I'm not gonna tell you, I'm not gonna tell you. He started to give me some whiskey and I don't drink, so I said, if you give me some pot, maybe, but I'm joking. <laughs> so, these are the things. The other one is Skype. Uh, so, uh, Roberto is gonna talk about it. I mean, Skype is a very, very sensitive issue, actually, because uh, it is, uh, I mean, I, I use it too. I still use it after I know what I know. Because, uh, unfortunately, I, I hope that nobody else knows what we know now. Anyway, <laughs> Skype uh, actually is, uh, it has, uh, uh, there, there have been a lot of vulnerabilities found about Skype. Some of them have been patched, some of them not. But uh, believe me, believe me, and uh, uh, you should, you should be very careful to who you give your Skype login, okay? And then Roberto is gonna explode this thing. Okay, so here we'll explain a little bit. So there is, I mean, industrial espionage has always existed. There are some legitimate, legitimate ways of, do it, uh, uh, of doing it and uh, some unlegitimate ways of doing it. The legitimate ways uh, include and involve uh, the use of uh, uh, you know, business intelligence tools and everything else. Uh, the unlegitimate ways involve the use of uh, illegal acts like stealing information. You need to understand one thing. Uh, Italy accepted, and I'm uh, Italian, uh, most of the countries, uh, like United States, France, and everything, I don't know about Germany actually, uh, they uh, have a very good link between industry and institutions. So you have um, uh, the secret services of the institutions that uh, work uh, very closely with the industry just to help the economy of the country. I said, unfortunately, Italy is not doing that because our secret services don't have this type of uh, power. They cannot even do interceptions, actually, in Italy. Only the police can do it. But in the other countries, they can. And uh, the other one? Okay. So, and then the other thing, very useful to know, is that uh, uh, a lot of the research on security is uh, uh, being funded by governments. And uh, uh, there are a lot of the products that are uh, being sold right now, like for, uh, for example, firewalls, uh, intrusion detection systems, uh, uh, but especially fraud detection systems for telecommunication industries, which are being funded by secret services, Israelis, Americans, or otherwise. And uh, um, in some cases, uh, uh, I'm not gonna say the name of the companies, uh, we have been able to find uh, that uh, inside the, these uh, uh, tools, uh, they were backdoors, they were linking directly to the country that originated the finance, uh, the financing of this tool. So the next one. Okay, I already talked about it, so I think this is now the time of Roberto, except that uh, what I wanted to say just very briefly is that uh, what uh, you need uh, really to do to defend from this type of uh, threat uh, is uh, just to be really, really awake, you know, and uh, never let down your attention level. Because, uh, I mean, 
one thing about security is this one. Somebody once asked me, is there a really, 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 really secure system, something that uh, nobody can break? I say, no. The, the secret uh, is uh, knowing what the system does. Everybody of you knows it. You know, when you do an assessment, you do, you, know, you do a fingerprint of the systems you are assessing. But if you were to open a safe, you would uh, find out what type of safe it is, you know, uh, who constructed it, if there are bugs, how thick is the steel layer, so you can get you know, the right drill, etc. Once you know it, you find a way to get around it. If you don't know it, you don't find a way to get around it. In, uh, the, the basic secret then is not to let anybody know what type of security you are using and to really be, uh, to, to keep your attention level up. Okay, so these are all the definitions. I, I want to spare you these things now, so go to the next one. We already talked about this. Okay. So I just added this because, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's out of uh, repertory. Uh, how do you do it? I mean, it looks kind of uh, simple. You say, oh, well, I know all these things, you know, oh, uh, social engineering is very easy. You know the guy he was talking about before, Gaius, in, uh, in Kuala Lumpur at the hotel, he came up to me and said, uh, you know, I'm going to show you that I'm going to get your, the key of your room and get into your room. I said, huh. <laughs> I said, okay, show me. He came back and he came with the key of my room. I said, uh, what the fuck did you do? I said, I have also your account here. I said, uh, he put on a tie, he went there, he just spoke a little bit French, you know, and uh, nobody understood him, so they just gave him the thing. I don't know how the fuck he did it. I mean, I, I, I wasn't there. I, I tried to figure it out, but he did it. So the other, uh, the very dangerous thing, the other one is the employee's exploitation. I was working for a military industry doing uh, avionics a uh, few years back, and I remember that the most dangerous thing was uh, to let uh, the engineers that were working on uh, avionics go to lunch outside the company, because they were, uh, you know, the competitors uh, eating at the same, uh, you know, at the same bar, and they were going close to them, and they were just asking them, you know, ah, how did you do this thing? Ah, you are so good, and he was explaining the whole thing. I say, what the fuck is going on? I mean, we, we're just protecting everything and he was just explaining everything. So uh, you, either you kill them or I don't know what, but we get to that later. So go on. Okay, so this is the classic intelligence cycle. Okay, uh, you can find it. I just put it there just to show you the new one, which comes now. So... <laughs> So that intelligence cycle of before is the one costing a lot of money, you know, like the helicopters and all these type of things. So this is uh, what, uh, what is being used right now. It's actually really simple, but uh, nothing effective is complicated, as uh, everybody should know, okay? So uh, when uh, you need to do a, an exploitation of a company or something like that, I mean, I don't know for, uh, for uh, direct uh, knowledge, but, uh, you know, somebody explained it to me. It's, uh, you know, you do the open source intelligence catering on the company, uh, whatever it produces, then uh, target definition and acquisition, like if you were doing an, an, uh, an assessment. Then you do the vulnerability assessment and profiling, you know, like we were saying before, just to know what uh, you're going to get into. And then uh, you generate exploits. It takes uh, five people to do this. Five people, really skilled people, but five people. Not complicated uh, uh, with a mental complication, you know, just very simple people, really skilled, five people, they can do all this thing and generate a really big damage. They generate to exploit, then they, they need to set up the attack infrastructure because most of the times attacking a target is illegal. I mean, all of the times it is illegal, but uh, uh, I mean, it depends also what type of um, something you do it for the good of mankind or not. But anyway, usually it is illegal anyway. And uh, uh, what does it mean to set up an, at an attack infrastructure? If you are in a country where uh, that, uh, let's say that uh, you work uh, in Germany and uh, your exploit target is in Germany or is in France, let's say that it's in Germany, you will not have the attack come from Germany, right? Everybody knows that. So you need to set up a whole uh, uh, line of uh, servers that, or SOC servers, or proxy, or whatever, or shells that, that allow you to attack the actual target coming from another country. And then uh, uh, you need to make sure that the country where you are attacking from uh, doesn't uh, consider illegal that act. There are still few countries like that, like, for example, Russia. 
okay, like everybody knows. And then you do the deception array setup. Uh, what is the beauty of it? That uh, most of the times uh, it looks like, uh, I mean, you steal information, you attack a target, it never destroy it, just to get information. And uh, you make it look like that somebody else did it. Uh, maybe, you know, somebody that uh, you don't like too much and that you want these guys to get into legal trouble with the, with the target. And then you do the exploitation, you gather the information, and you sell it. That's as simple as that. Usually, these uh, gigos, like we were saying before, they do it uh, not directly. N you n never have a direct knowledge of these people, but uh, they use, uh, you know, intermediaries, which get percentages, and they get, they get paid this way. Net, cash, very clean. Basically, penetration test that you can recognize. This is a typical penetration testing scheme. Nothing different. Just deception array setup, maybe uh, it's not. Okay, so this is, uh, then I give the word to Roberto. This is one thing which uh, uh, is a project, it's taken from Terminator. There is a group called uh, Quantic, uh, which is not known around, but uh, I already mentioned it at Hack in the Box. Uh, now uh, I know that they have uh, uh, taken forward this project and uh, they are creating this array, which is very interesting, but very scary also, which is uh, a, an an artificial intelligence array just uh, of, uh, they want to create uh, machines uh, which can link together, uh, create a collectivity and uh, use it for destructive purposes. Uh, they are being monitored, but they are not being monitored by the right people, not, not by uh, institutions who believe that this thing is possible. And uh, I promised uh, to uh, to Tim that I was going to give some more news uh, at this conference, but uh, we don't have more than this right now, so maybe at the next one we're going to give some more information about it, because the project is being kept uh, really secret. And it's called Skynet 1.0, exactly as uh, in the Terminator movie. A, f a few more cases that happened this year. Uh, well, we're in Germany. Let's talk about T-Mobile. And you remember uh, it was a big case in the United States about uh, T-Mobile hack. Uh, a hacker was uh, uh, penetrating. Actually, we know it, he did it through uh, a bare web server logic uh, flow, which, by the way, is still present. <laughs> and. Uh, he took over the interface of uh, resellers of T-Mobile, being capable to reverse the information, starting from a telephone number, getting then the, all the information of the people, all the sub subscribers, including username and passwords of the uh, emails. This was leading later on also to the compromission of Paris Hilton uh, uh, email box. And uh, the case was covered uh, very much by the, by the press. Why they got caught? They got caught because uh, the guy who did it uh, um, actually put his hands over uh, an email box uh, of a T-Mobile subscribers. That was the email box belonging to a CIA agent. And this CIA agent was using this email box uh, just to bounce uh, his private uh, uh, mail to the office mail and vice versa. So on this email box, uh, um, secret documents they were transiting. So the smart guy, what he did, he, he got a copy of a, a very secret uh, uh, paper and went on IRC saying, hey, look what I got. <laughs> Are you interested? And eventually, even we, this is not industrial espionage, but it's still, we, were, uh, we wanted to discuss about it, because uh, uh, the guy actually ended up offering uh, uh, a service on the internet, uh, PayPal-based, where he was uh, reverse, reversing the information, starting from the, the cell phone uh, number, and then giving out uh, 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 username passwords of the, of the email of the sub subscriber. So he did it for money. This is why we're mentioning this case here. T-Mobile, T-Mobile. Is T-Mobile bad? Actually, T-Mobile, it is just a telecommunication company. I, we wanted, we actually, he personally has some specific uh, knowledge about the field, we wanted to put you some numbers to let you understand what uh, 
uh, a big telecommunication company means today. It means 100,000 servers, more than 100,000 clients, desktops, usually average 18 million of kilometers of cabling, then between 10,000 and 20,000 of handles Palm UMTS telephone, and uh, between 10,000 and 20,000 of notebooks. Now, you understand, you can be the genius of the uh, security, IT security, you will never succeed. You will never be capable to secure 100% such structure. It's nearly impossible. This is why it is important what he was saying, that you, must, you should be aware about uh, uh, possible intrusions and you should start uh, accordingly exactly right now, like if somebody was already in. Please. So just, uh, just one thing. Uh, this is actually a very important issue because you get this telecommunication company which has a lot of software. I remember when the Slammer incident happened or the MS Blaster incident happened, all the security managers were blamed. Say, oh, you didn't patch the system. I say, why the fuck do I need to buy a system to patch it? So. Uh, imagine, uh, I don't know if, uh, how many of you know the Osprey project. The Osprey was uh, this uh, helicopter with, uh, uh, that was becoming an airplane afterwards. It had two big you know, engines making a vertical uh, takeoff and then becoming an airplane and going. It was a military project uh, from the, for the Marines. It was uh, worth billions of dollars for Bell helicopters in America. Uh, when the first one crashed, uh, killing 50 Marines, you know, the Congress said, wait. There's a problem. This thing is flawed. Okay, the second one crashed and the project was totally stopped. Okay, so can you imagine having a Boeing 747 that needs a patch? Like you fly and say, shit, it fell down. Wow, I didn't have the patch. Let's download the patch for the Boeing 747. I mean, you kill 200 people, you will never let a, a piece of equipment or technology like that go in unpatched or like with the evolved beta version. Okay? On the other hand, we have all the software we get. It's totally imperfect. You know, we are the testers of the software. I download the patch every week. I mean, uh, if, uh, if there was a critical system, what would they do? And for a telecommunication operator, it's the same thing. I mean, every time you buy a new server, you hook in and you get a virus because it's not patched. I mean, you need to download the patch from the, from the company. So uh, this is a thing of, uh, also of responsibility. Okay, uh, from the security perspective, who is responsible? Is uh, the, the manufacturer that gives you an imperfect thing or is the operator that uses the software? He, he bought it, he paid money for it, and it is not working. Okay, and this is uh, an issue actually that, uh, I mean, maybe it doesn't relate uh, to the hacker community, or maybe yes, I mean, because it's good to have imperfect things to, to tamper with. But uh, the reason why you can tamper with these things is because they are being uh, released uh, flawed. And, uh, and uh, they just know they are flawed from the beginning. Uh, going quickly through other cases uh, that happened this year, uh, what's espionage in Israel, you were reading certainly about this uh, big, big scandal that the telecommunication companies and big industry co industries companies, there were some, some guys in the board, they were actually acting illegally, sending Trojans uh, to... to other Israeli companies and uh, uh, creating so uh, damages. It was actually hitting the news. The interesting thing it is that this is going on since 10 years at least, but only now we are, are hearing about it. And uh, it's not going on only against uh, uh, Israeli uh, companies. Actually, this is a kind of uh, ping pong war. Uh, we will see later a much better example. You also were reading about Chinese uh, uh, servers attacking uh, US or UK servers. This is uh, what we were all reading, but we have two specific cases we want to talk to you about. And one it is actually related very much to zonh.org. One of the guy, uh, one of the founder of the zonh.org is uh, currently the administrator of the European Community Server some of the European community servers in Bruxelles. And what he got recently, 
he got a wave, a large wave of uh, uh, attacks through mails or direct attacks trying to exploit uh, operating system services, trying to infect the system, installing a Trojan. So he analyzed the Trojan and he found out that uh, basically the Trojan was uh, a programmable, programmable Trojan, from, a reprogrammable Trojan from remote that was linking back to the Guangzhou uh, province in, uh, in China. And at the moment uh, he received it in the European Community Service in Bruxelles, the Trojan was programmed to research for uh, Word and Excel files, uh, just for uh, unspecific uh, Word and Excel file. But the, program, the, the Trojan had also reprogramming uh, fun functionality. Another case I want to tell you that we uh, heard about it. We were holding a seminar um, in uh, uh, South Korea, in Seoul, together with a local uh, CERT, and the chief of the CERT told me, you know, Roberto, we actually found uh, a, a large wave of uh, attacks through email or even direct attacks coming from North Korea. And then I asked him, uh, oh, how did you find, find out? Uh, North Korea doesn't have any uh, internet infrastructure, by my knowledge, or it is very limited. And he told me, yeah, 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 we traced it. Actually, they were using Chinese servers to attack our institution. And then I was thinking, how the hell did you find it out? I mean, the only way you found it out, it was to counter hacking those servers in China, eventually seeing from which point of the planet the originating attacking attack was. So basically, he did something totally illegal. He couldn't tell me. But uh, I guess all of us, w we would have done exactly the same. Now, another very good case happened in Italy. You know, we are shoemakers in Italy. Not the drivers, just we're doing shoes very well. Italian shoes are very much appreci appreciated uh, uh, in, uh, in the world. And there is a specific part of Italy, which is the northwest part of Italy, in which area the shoes are produced. Now, we were used to see hordes of Chinese and Japanese guys. At the moment, the shoes model, you know, in Milano, we have, I'm from Milano, we have the, it's the city of, of the fashion, no, the fashion capital of Italy. And the fashion in the world, it is basically managed between France, between Paris and Milano. Okay, most of it. Shit. <laughs> and, well, less people. Each time I say shit, something is clapping. This is cool. <laughs> shit! <laughs> <laughs> Where to go? <laughs> cool. <laughs> so we were, we were used about seeing uh, Chinese and Japanese coming to the outside on the street, uh, taking pictures outside the window of the, of the boutiques uh, and uh, trying to get pictures of the new brand, new models of shoes, uh, so that they could come back to the uh, original country and make copies. This is not anymore in this way. This year, Italian shoes uh, maker uh, experienced a, a, a drop about 60% of their uh, uh, market share due to the fact that uh, these Chinese uh, are not anymore coming to take pictures. Uh, they are just hacking the server, downloading uh, the production files uh, directly from the production unit even before the shoes goes in production producing it working overnight, shipping it, so it, you know, it takes time, still they hit the market, the Italian market, much earlier than the original product hits. So you can understand Italian companies are pretty much pissed off by this. <laughs> a very good case also I want to talk about, it's quite old. This is a, uh, tracing back to 2001. Uh, Personally, I was very much in touch by that time with Pakistanis and Indians, and Indians because I was very much attracted by the cyber war, which was not only based on defacements between the two countries. The cyber war was based mostly over the issue of the uh, Kashmir territory. We, you know uh, about the story. But by that time, ISI, which is the Pakistani Secret Service, and we personally know, know at least two guys that they were working for Pakistani Secret Services, 
they were taking guys, young guys, and uh, uh, using these young guys, Pakistanis, to hack Indian uh, uh, servers to get information. One of the servers who got compromised uh, at least twice, it is the Bark server, which is the server of the Atomic uh, uh, Committee uh, under the Ministry of the Energy. And uh, from this server, uh, plans for the development of new cores uh, uh, for atomic reactor has been stolen. Well, you know, Pakistan is always up, up to date with uh, nuclear uh, stuff. They don't have a very big research uh, team, but they have good hackers. And uh, also, no, just come back one second. Uh, uh, if you ever heard about Hexalab, well, some Europeans, they were also involved. Some Dutch guys, they were also involved. But um, Hexalab is a, a team based in Pakistan whose scope it is to develop uh, zero-day uh, vulnerabilities and exploits. And then such exploits are used long time ago uh, also for defacing. Now they stopped uh, since two years to do such uh, stupid things. Uh, but they're still used to compromise the Western servers to get information that are uh, uh, basically turned to the Pakistani secret services. This is a very good case. We were exactly one year ago together spending vacation uh, uh, in Caribbean islands. And I was reading, uh, under the sun, I was reading the MIT book, uh, the MIT Technology uh, Magazine. And this, in MIT Technology Magazine, it was a very good article talking about uh, a new program from US Army. We have to rush a little bit called FCS, Future Combat System, which is half on its way of the development. This is a 21, uh, actually it is now it is $23 billion, got recently upgraded, program that actually sees the completely restructure the way America will do the war in the next years. Not any more heavy tanks, uh, big battalions of people, uh, weak networks, uh, but a new system based on a huge super network called Mosaic. This huge super network is actually managing through proprietary protocols, but also uh, using TCP IP, some subnets which are deployed on the territory. And uh, subnets are used to deploy information to distribute uh, awareness and intelligence data so that uh, the uh, Americans will totally change the way they will do the war. Instead of big, large number of soldiers, they will have small families of soldiers deployed on the uh, fight territory, uh, very well informed about what is going on, because they have spies, uh, uh, satellites and drones flying over the territory, mapping it, and giving them information about the enemy uh, location. Now, if, if this is the way America is, is uh, developing the new way to do uh, uh, the war, we were thinking, well, it's based on a network. So if it is based on a network, it's hacker stuff. It's hacker territory. If yesterday, if you wanted to fight the United States, you had to take a gun and fight Vietnam, for example, even with unconventional method, nowadays probably you might be able to fight just by blocking the network. If you block such network, you co completely destroy America's capability to coordinate the troops on the territory. So we were thinking, let's try to imagine to be, for example, Russians. Russians are very active in, uh, in such kind of uh, military espionage. And let's try to see from open sources how much good information we can find in order to eventually, of course we, we didn't do it, compromise uh, the servers of the company who are developing uh, such system located on a US territory, and let's see how easy it is. So we did. We discovered that uh, the full network uh, protocol and management is uh, based uh, on a 31 million lines of, uh, of unaudited code, because nobody is going to audit a military system. No, it's not open source like Linux. Even though Linux uh, is somehow entering, a special Berkeley University version of Linux, militarized university is still entering into such program, uh, such project, but still we have 31 millions of lines of unaudited code. Well, I would like to look if it is possible to put my hands over such amount of unaudited code 
I can imagine how much, how much vulnerabilities I can find. So, strangely, on Boeing website, this is only in America you can find such things, uh, you have the full list of the developers of every single aspect of the project, the name of the team leader, his email server and telephone address. <laughs> now, this is exact, if I was Russian and I wanted to steal things, I would start exactly from such servers. And this is not actual decoys servers, this is true uh, uh, information. We started to give lectures about this problem one year ago in March in Indonesia. Also in the comic book, yes, we, are we did the second episode of, the, of our comics who was talking about such uh, trouble. July of this year, I was in Rome, I got in contact because I was called by a guy from the US Embassy. We saw several military people attending our speeching when we were talking about such troubles, because in our speech we were showing uh, specifically some weak points of, what, uh, of the information about, uh, uh, on the information what we found actually about uh, such, such uh, program. Anyway, this military guy, US military guy told me, um, do you know um, any ring of uh, um, stealers of uh, information related to military, US military uh, programs uh, um, through attacks originating from uh, East Europe. And I said, are you talking about Russian stealing FCS stuff? And then he became white. He said, uh, FCS? Mm, uh, I don't know, what is it? No. <laughs> it's happening. And of course, if you don't have the money to fight a superpower like the United States, in the traditional way, you do it in a conventional way, using hackers. I don't want another Cisco versus Lean and Black Hat case, so there is no name here. <laughs> Shit. Shit. <laughs> Where is Tim Pritlove? CCC is going to get some troubles, I guess, for this. No, uh, well, you have to know, did you know that Skype had uh, uh, just recently, they fixed it, but they had a double login issue. If you were logging in with the username and password from two different servers, most of the time you, you were capable to get uh, the, the TXT uh, information, not the voice, but the, the TXT chat, uh, basically mirrored on, the, on both computers uh, 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 that logged with your username and password. What does it mean? It means, excuse me? Feature. A, a very good feature. Yes, excellent feature. In fact, uh, maybe uh, also you certainly know that Skype.net was owned for several months. Therefore, your feature gets a tr becomes a trouble if somebody owning Skype server knows your username and password. No? Then we have on. If you, we have an unresolved privilege escalation issue also. If you go on zonish.org, you have, um, you can find an advisory, six months old. In the meantime, three new releases of Skype went out and no patches. And uh, there is also a zero day vulnerability, which is allowing uh, arbitrary remote execution of code. And we know at least one case of uh, uh, when such vulnerability was used to compromise the, a, serv a server, a client uh, of a guy working in a big company to steal information. So be careful when you're using Skype, basically. Now, what is this? A question to you guys. It's a picture, yes. <laughs> it's a question mark. It's made in China, a very good statement. What is this, please? It's a network card. Question. <laughs> we have a very qualified audience here. Congratulations. Question to you that you are saying that it's a network card. How do you know it's a network card? It looks like a network card. How do you know what's actually the functional, internal functionality of this? You just trust it. 
The point is, we are all bitching about, uh, fuck, Windows is not releasing the source code. Where the problem could be just under your, um, under your eyes, on a lower layer of the IT security. I mean, we're all bitching on the fact that we want to have open source code, beside the fact that none of you basically audited the Firefox uh, 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 source code. Who did it? <laughs> See? No? You're just, what, one. You're just using it because you're trusting that he actually, the other guy, did it, uh, and vice versa. But uh, do you know what's happening in the chip? No. Laws today are forbidding even you to reverse engineer such equipment. Uh, you get in trouble if you do it. You don't even have the right to know what's going on in your network card. And if I was uh, in a possibility to de develop a product uh, uh, to spy, definitely I would have put something inside the network card, network equipment. Try to go and, and, and look for it. You will never be able. So w when you're mounting a network card, you're just trusting and hoping that it's a network card. And as long as it looks like a network card, he's happy. <laughs> so this is another question mark, I know. So what I... <laughs> Shit. No. Never mind. So what, what, uh, what, what the point is of all this, I mean, uh, it would take weeks just uh, to exploit all these issues, okay? So uh, be also patient on the fact of Skype. Uh, we uh, are not saying the whole thing just because there was a big incident at the Black Hat this year. I don't know if you know about that, but, you know, the Black Hat was sued and everything because somebody talked about the Cisco thing. So we are very careful about talking about it. Anyway, what, uh, how we wanted to close is, uh, I mean, uh, we searched uh, in history to find uh, the perfect security guy, okay? And uh, who could that be? Who could that be? Who could that be? That's him. I mean, he got the thing built, you know, all these pyramids and everything, you know, there is all these guys working. And then I didn't find the slide with uh, people being slaughtered afterwards, but uh, actually he killed them all afterwards. So the message is uh, either we get a security manager or some uh, good security people that, uh, you know, get the job done and then they kill everybody, and, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, I mean, we just need to live with it and, uh, and uh, be patient, okay, be really aware about what's happening and uh, uh, try also to focus on the right target. Like if you are a hacker, you are doing the right thing, exploiting uh, all this uh, uh, shit software that is being released to us because, I mean, everything, uh, every time I buy something, there is something that doesn't go well, something that doesn't work, and uh, it can always, always be exploited, and that pisses me off. It okay. protects them. I mean, if you release a piece of, uh, I don't know, virus, uh, you get jailed. But if Sony does it, uh, then it's okay. And that's another thing, digital right management. Did you ever hear about the Sony thing? I mean, everybody did. That's a Trojan, a legal Trojan that was released by Sony Corporation, you know, just to control you. Imagine just not to let you copy your MP3 file into, you know, another computer, because I may have two computers, okay? Anyway, so just to close, uh, this is another little thing. We were talking about Trojans. We were talking about exploitation of software, okay? So never mind the picture, but uh, uh, do you know that uh, most of uh, the institutions right now, just to do investigation, before there was the phone interception, okay? Phone interception has been done through a legal uh, warrant, okay, of the judge, I mean, in most of the demo democratic countries, that is being given to an operator which does or, you know, uh, allows this interception to happen, and it has a time period, and it is logged, and everything. Now, with the internet, uh, they invented these things which are, uh, you know, legal Trojans, which is called injected interception. It's, a, it's just, uh, there are some companies which are focused, their business model is just to, to build Trojans which can be used by institutions. The only problem, what is it? I mean, if I'm being investigated, it is correct with a judge with a warrant that gives a warrant that I'm being uh, intercepted. But if uh, uh, with a tool like this, I mean, there is no control. The warrant, to who do you give the warrant? 
the, the institution does have the, the way to get into your machine, exploiting the vulnerabilities of your machine, because it is vulnerable, and uh, uh, you will never know when it starts, when it ends, and if it is authorized, okay? And uh, I mean, I'm a very respectful of institutions, I work with institutions, but they are human beings. So it could happen also that these things are being used not for investigative purposes or to or for crime prevention. So that's how I wanted to close. I don't think uh, we have uh, time for questions, but we're gonna be around for three days now, so you can uh, ask uh, whatever you want if you have questions uh, to us in the next two days. Thank you very much. I put the CD down.